Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and happy Friday, and welcome to this, uh, the latest in our series of webinars all about the Public Health England Prevention Concordat for Better Mental Health. My name's Richard Taunt. I'm Anna Howells. My name's Lily McCurry. Uh, and it's, 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 a, it's a special webinar we've got today. It's a bit, it's a bit like Avengers Assemble, I feel. We've got a fantastic uh, cast today. Uh, it's wonderful to be joined by uh, Jim McManus from Hertfordshire uh, and Christina Gipgray from Somerset. And we'll be hearing from Jim and Christina as we go through. So uh, some fantastic speakers uh, and a really important topic today, all about translating strategies, ideas into deliverable commitments. Um, thank you if you've joined one of these webinars before, uh, and a warm welcome if this is your if this is your first. Um, these these webinars are, are partly about uh, sharing uh, ideas, best practice, uh, working from across the country, uh, but more than anything, they're about uh, discussion and debate. So we'd love for you to get involved as we go through. Uh, Anna, how can people do that? Yeah, there's three ways you can join the discussion today. You can post a question using the question box facility on your screens. Um, you can email hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare or you can join us on Twitter using hashtag prevention concordat. Excellent. Uh, and if you have technical difficulties, say hypothetically, for example, you managed to spill your coffee all over your laptop. I've never done that. Uh, uh, don't worry, we are recording. Uh, so you might well be watching back at a later date. Uh, if so, fantastic. Great that you've been able to join. That ask question function probably isn't going to be as useful, uh, but please do still feel free to share your uh, observations or comments uh, through Twitter or by sending us an email. Uh, thank you again for joining. Um, Lily, this Prevention Concordat thing, what is it? Yeah, so the Prevention Concordat is for the first time a way of Public Health England helping every area in the country to establish better prevention planning arrangements, all focused on increasing the amount of work that is focused on prevention. So we've chosen to highlight the prevention of mental health problems, the promotion of good mental health as areas to galvanise people's action and thinking. We've really highlighted both in the resources and the way that we've talked to partners about how they can help, but the importance of cross-sector cross, cross -sector action. So that means everyone from local authorities, the NHS, the voluntary sector, you know, again, you'll see examples in the different webinars of the Blue Light organisations and others all um, coming together around this really important topic. What we found as well is that actually both in our work before the, the events and, and talking to people around the country, we've been, you know, from far north as Durham and then going right the way across to Plymouth and the southwest and Birmingham yesterday, where we were hearing and having reinforced back to us the importance of leadership, of partnership working, of joint planning and coming to get together around some joint objectives and also intelligence led decision making. And so that's where we've really focused these webinars and events and all of the tools and resources that we've put into place to help support people to work together. Really, thank you very much. Lots of lovely logos there. Um, what do they resemble? Uh, yeah, so again, obviously, you know, there's no point in talking about cross sector cross sector action or um, partnership unless actually you've got the backing of you know some of the key influences. And that's where we started from. You know, we heard what areas were saying about what would help, what they're already doing. Every area of the country is already doing something, but they want to do more. And so we very from very early on we've been working with um, the Association of Directors of Public Health, the Faculty of Public Health, Department of Health and others to help pull together what would work best. They've all endorsed the, the products and, and the spirit and even more we've now got 35 different national organisations that have supported as signatories of the Concordat. Lovely, Lily, thank you very much. Uh, and Lily, as, you, as you mentioned, there's been a whole raft of events, uh, both face to face and digital. We're not going to do which was our favourite event because it's probably going to be un unfair. Probably the best lunch. Uh, <laughs> partly, partly, about, partly about lunch, perhaps. Uh, but again, you might well have joined one of our face to face events as we've toured around the country in our Convention Concordat bus. Uh, we hope you had a constructive day. You did join us. Um, Lily, only a, only a couple of dates left now. Yes, so we are coming towards the end of the face-to-face -face events, which is why it's great to have these webinars that will continue to live and be something that people can interact with. So next week we've got London and then also Liverpool, so we're heading to the northwest. Lovely, and then Cambridge uh, in about a month's time. Uh, and then we're going to do a final digital discussion in June, uh, just bury the date, to reflect on the whole programme of events. Uh, but this is actually the last in our sort of set programme of, 
of webinars. So um, there'll be a, there won't be a dry, dry eye in the house as we come to the end of it. Um, and again, thanks if you've been joining us throughout. And if, if you have been joining us, you'll, be know, you'll know that we've structured a number of these webinars around five key uh, aspects, which were included in the Prevention Concordat planning resource, which came out nearly in August, September. Yes, yeah, so soft launch in August, and then we formally launched at the Public Health England conference in September. Thank you very much. Um, and so we've been having webinars in each of these five areas. Uh, and today's area, it's all about translating need into deliverable commitments. Uh, th that, can, that can sound a bit jargony, um, but what's at the heart of this is about having ideas which happen. So not just having a, an aim, uh, but following that up with action. Uh, and this topic particularly came through in a piece of work which the King's Fund worked on with Public Health England um, about a year ago now, a bit, bit, yeah. bit more, when the French Good Call Out was being developed, uh, which included a stock take of planning arrangements for the French mental health problems all across England, which includes one observation which we've, which we've put here, uh, saying that there's often a sizable list of aspirations in relation to public health mental health at the strategic level, but in many areas it appeared that as yet there had been fewer specific commitments and deliverables included in operational action plans, uh, and the majority of these are not measurable targets. So this divide between having having good ideas and seeing them happen as uh, something which the uh, King's Funds and others observed when looking at arrangements across the country. And so how you how you get over this, how you actually do have uh, aims which get translated into reality is the topic of our discussion today. Uh, and very pleased uh, joining us is uh, Christina Gray uh, from Somerset. Christina, I don't think we can see you, but we can certainly hear you. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Christina, thanks so much for joining. Do you want to say uh, a bit about who you are uh, and then launch into that presentation? Absolutely. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Christina. Um, I cons I'm a consultant in public health down in Somerset. Um, I'm also the chair of the Faculty uh, Public Mental Health um, special interest group. And um, in that um, capacity, I've been working very closely with Lily, Richard, uh, Anna and others and Jim in the development of the Concordat. So um, we've got quite a tough challenge today, I think Jim and I feel, um, this um, translating need into deliverable commitments. Um, I guess what, all, what this is about is it's very easy. The easy bit is having the high level strategic aims. It's very important to have those, but actually what we've got to address at a local level is what we then do about that. So if you'd like to scroll down, please. So I, the first thing I wanted to say is that having been in this business for a while, actually national strategy is really important. If you have a good national strategy, it sets the scene. So the Prevention Concordat for Better Mental Health does that for us. It sets out the case for prevention. It describes the partnerships. It describes what positive mental health is and how we might take action. And it sets out the economic case. So it, it sets the scene. The question then is, and if you'd like to scroll down, is locally, what do we do? So for me, local strategy tells the story. We take the national narrative and we put it into a local perspective. So we have to say, what's our local response to this? What does, what does all this national narrative mean for this place, this place that I am in, that we are in? And how do we talk about th this here? And for that reason, I think that the Concordat's framed, um, framed the task task very helpfully in not being overly prescriptive because what will, what will be right in one area of the country will not be right in another. So if you could scroll down. The commonality is we are all concerned about making things happen. And there are some key questions, I think, for us. It's where does this sit within our business, within our local authority or within our health um, organization, within our voluntary sector group? What priorities and gaps have we got? And we've got much more intelligence now around um, mental health and positive mental health than we had previously. And what are the opportunities? Let's push at the open doors rather than, than hammer away at the closed, one, the closed doors. And what will we do and what difference will, we, will, will that make? 
And at this point, I just want to um, re-emphasise what Lily has already said, which is that in preparing for today, I had a quick flick through all of the webinars, um, the seven previous webinars, and there was a wealth of information and case studies already there. You know, fantastic presentations from Bristol and Haringey, um, an overview uh, around, around leadership from Wakefield and Basildon, the police around the blue light services, some in, input on the voluntary sector. So uh, what I would uh, commend everybody to do is to go back and just flick through the other webinars because there are very, very good examples of um, uh, local action um, in, 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 in those, in those um, pieces. So if we um, just scroll down a little bit. So what I wanted to do today was to, um, uh, to frame the question in a way that was manageable. And I'm going to suggest that in pursuing our local narrative, there are probably three themes that we can think about under which a range of activity or action will flow. So the first one is about how do we increase protective factors in our place? How do we protect and promote um, positive mental well-being? How do we reduce exposure to risk? And how do we address the harms that have already occurred? And I think if we think about the, those three blocks, um, it, it will be helpful. So if you just scroll down. I should say, Christina, that we haven't paid you to uh, say, go back and watch <laughs> I, I thought they were great, great really, really inspiring, all of them. Okay, we'll put the check in the post. <laughs> Thank you. So just thinking about increasing protective factors here, these are just some examples. They're not, this is not an exhaustive list. And everyone listening in and everybody who is participating in this exercise will, will have their own fantastic examples. But increasing protective factors is about putting health and well-being in all policies, not thinking about mental health and well-being necessarily as a separate thing, but what are the opportunities in all policies? And through that, creating the circumstances through culture um, and other opportunities in housing, education and the environment to create protective, um, a, a protective uh, place um, where where well-being thrives, and um, I've I wanted to, uh, to to get us to think a little bit, um, perhaps outside of the box, because I think I imagine most most of us who are participating participating in this webinar will be from from the public sector, but actually there is a huge amount going on out there which is not necessarily badged as mental health or public mental health or the Prevention Concordat, which absolutely delivers to this agenda. So, for example, if we want to de develop active habits, um, have a look at playing out. Have a look at ping pong land or ping land, which is the, the ping pong tables all across the cities. And there are pianos as well. There's piano land as well. Um, if we think about connecting and creating, have a look at what Hull has done. Um, through their um, City of Culture program, absolutely fantastic. And there are, there are national initiatives like the Big Sing, um, community choirs springing up all over the country. And if you just scroll down a little bit more. But then I suppose these are, these are slightly more traditional uh, ways of thinking about health and well-being. Green and blue spaces. We've got the National Parks Programme. And I really like this one, which is have a look at Liverpool. Liverpool, big city, big programme around a, a green city initiative. And we know about the protective factors of green space on uh, mental health. And then the happy and well children's agenda, which is absolutely core to our public health um, program. So we have lots of opportunities, both directly within our gift and within the wider um, sphere to protect and promote mental well-being. So moving on. 
Christina, thank you. I should say that uh, if you're wanting a copy of these slides, if you're watching live, uh, there's a handouts tab on GoToWebinar where you can download them now. If you're watching back later, just drop us an email, hello at clivescope.healthcare, and we'll send them straight through to you. Christina. So then um, thinking about reducing exposure to risk, we know that there are particular harms, a lot of evidence now around the particular harms which are, 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 that really damage um, our mental health, both in the short term and long term. So opportunities through healthy workplaces, healthy schools, um, reducing bullying, um, promoting positive relationships, homes, building good homes, warm homes, the loneliness agenda, um, and, and working closely with our, our children's colleagues and providing additional support for vulnerable children and children looked after who we know will have um, been exposed um, to um, challenging circumstances and we can take protective action which will have lifelong benefits. So scrolling down a bit more. And finally, addressing harms. I mean, I guess in public health speak, this, this would be uh, more secondary prevention, but very important and lots of opportunities um, for those of us who want to promote and protect mental health. Um, working through our drug and alcohol um, programs, which are public health responsibility, um, working um, uh, with offender management and with our children's services again um, to reduce the impacts um, on um, children from having a, a, a parent in prison. Bereavement, we know um, that any bereavement has, a, has a, an impact. We also know that there are some sorts of bereavement, bereavement from suicide, sudden bereavement, uh, being bereaved as a child, um, have greater impact. So that in our local areas, we have an opportunity to look at what we are doing around bereavement, what services are there and how we might support them. Discrimination, interpersonal violence and abuse, those are issues which are very live for all of us at the moment, very much in the public domain. Um, and there are many opportunities, both in the, the public and the private sphere, to form alliances to make sure that we reduce um, these impacts. So just to wind up, um, I guess I just wanted to say, I think the, the opportunities to create the circumstances that promote and protect our mental health are all around us. We don't have to badge them as mental health or well-being. We just need to understand them for what they are. Often the action will be someone else's business as usual. So equally, I think we don't have to be um, precious about this. It is about lighting the fires. It is about encouraging people to do, um, to do what they're doing and to go further and to do it more and better. And I think collectively, if we can see and foster and allow, um, actually what we will be doing is in enabling and creating a social movement for change and both within our local authorities and nationally which will transform lives of both of individuals and communities and I do think that that is um, what the Prevention Concordat has um, started and is enabling us to do. Thank you. Christina, many, many thanks indeed. And a, a lovely way to end with a, a beautiful song there. And your contact details, Christina, if people want to get in touch and follow up any of those points. Absolutely, yes. Lovely. Christina, thank you very much indeed. Uh, just quickly before we go on to Jim, Anna, can you remind people how they can get involved? Sure, there's three ways you can join the conversation. Um, you can post a question using the question box facility. You can email hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare or you can join us on Twitter using hashtag prevention concordat. Uh, thank you very much. And Christina, thank you again. A, a lovely walkthrough. And again, just to remind people that if you want to access any of those links, just download those slides using the handout tab. Um, or if you're watching later, email us, hello at clydescope.healthcare, and we can send those on to you. Uh, Jim, thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, and then we'll go into the presentation. Hello, sorry, can you hear me all right? I had a bit of a glitch there. Um, my name is Jim McManus. I'm the uh, Public Mental Health Lead for the Association of Directors of Public Health, um, which means I get to work with people like Christina, uh, and Lily and colleagues at PHE 
uh, and I'm Director of Public Health for Hertfordshire. And um, just a couple of things to say before I start. Christina said, push at open doors rather than hammering away at closed ones. That for me is a really important point just because there's so much work that needs to be done in this. And sometimes in public health, we like to perfectly systematize things before we start. But there's so much work here that I think we just have to start somewhere and then build a framework and system as we go along, rather than seek to work with people who won't work with us. We have to be, I think, opportunistic. So if you can go on to the next slide. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a team of people um, who have little bits of mental health. So Jen Beard does a lot of work in schools, peers, leads our public mental health framework and also our um, work on suicide with Manika Kalo and Nathan Shelley and elected members. So um, I have built a kind of an infrastructure of people to work on this. Uh, and we've got an elected member champion in each of the um, 11 councils in Hertfordshire. Um, and that for me enables me to get things done, but also to be opportunistic. If we can move on to the next slide. So I think there are some principles for actually turning this concordat into reality. The first of this is you have to see it as a systems approach. It's actually an attempt to influence systems, and that means you need to touch and interact with the system at various places, rather than just have a linear map of, well, I'll do this um, and start here. And you know, I think you have to work with the willing and be a bit opportunistic and get many people moving. The second is building a movement of these actors is every bit as important as having a roadmap. Um, third, leadership is crucial. And that's actually uh, as much about blending technical and interpersonal leadership as understanding the context of the relationship. So leadership in this is multidimensional. The next thing I think is you need a life course vision. You do need some kind of framework to tell you whether you're actually making any difference, but you need to chunk that up and um, you have to encourage learning. We're very lucky here that the university has an MSc in mental health recovery and inclusion, and they have bursaries for masters and doctoral study um, for people with lived experience, some of whom are now working for the council um, in uh, mental health commissioning or provider rules. So for me, that's been one of the best things about this piece of work. If we can move on. Um, this is my attempt at a life course framework for public mental health um, from preconception through to old age. And I think there's something for everybody to do. Um, and in Hertfordshire, I think we've got lots of people doing things. So in Stevenage, you can be going in ostensibly um, to get smoking advice or physical activity advice, but actually going in to see a voluntary sector mental health service in the same building, for example. We do a lot of work on money advice because that's a net generator of uh, avoidable uh, mental health issues in many places. So I think the trick is to identify what each actor can do and the thing about Christine's presentation is she's given you a load of resources that you can use from the starting point you want to start with. The point of a framework is to help keep us on track here, not to govern it or to be um, the be all and end all. It's to help us work out where we are. Next slide, please. Um, so I talked about coalitions of learning and action. Um, we have 547 schools. We have an anti-bullying approach across all of them. We have whole school mental health programs building. We have about 20 clusters of schools working on mental health together. We've built a, a cohort of governors who've been trained on exam stress and taking a whole school approach to that. And you're welcome to have any of these resources if you want them. We've got 13 elected members now who are mental health champions, 10 in districts and three in counties. Uh, we are making sure that all our children's centers have a mental health offer. We've done quite a lot of work with faith communities using the Faith Action and the uh, Livability Mental Health Packs. And um, we've actually uh, built 1,500 workplace mental health advisors across Hertfordshire employers. And our sexual health services and CAB uh, agencies are also 
um, taking this seriously. We've got a specific money advice and mental health project. And we think these are all preventive and resilient as much as they are supportive. And uh, it is a case of not controlling people, but identifying what they can do, sitting down and talking with them and getting them to do it. And sometimes there's been money attached and sometimes there hasn't. Next slide, please. Um, so we have attempted a Hartfordshire framework. Um, we, we tried a whole system framework, which is in draft and has been through our health and wellbeing board. Um, and uh, we need to go back and we've uh, continually kind of recreated it a little, but there's probably four features of it. First is the phasing. So we phase it by life course. And the second is we layer interventions from policy interventions we can do, like employers having policies for work-life balance and providing stuff right through to stuff for individuals. And our watchwords in this are kind of resilience. We've got quite a lot of work going on. Even our libraries have got a bibliotherapy offer. Prevention and actually tiering of services. We have to do much more on pathway development and tiering, but uh, we know we've, we've got some significant gaps. So the framework has been good at showing us where the gaps are. The Health and Wellbeing Board monitor it and elected member champions in every council hold us to account. And in fact, we're quite often invited around different councils to explain what we're doing. And that kind of continually keeping it on the political radar is quite useful. Next slide, please. Um, so we have a number of current projects. I'm not going to say much about this um, other than to say these are some of the things that in light of the prevention concord that we started to rework. So we had a year of mental health in 2015. We've now launched a Just Talk campaign for young people. We've got a lot of champions engaged. We have a group of young people who have been trained to basically scrutinise commissioners about how commissioners commission. And we've set them to work on how commissioners put mental health resilience and prevention into their work. So there's a whole load of areas that we are revisiting in light of what we can do on prevention. And the one that we're about to start off uh, next week is trying to get all the district councils to agree with us to develop a common approach to gambling licensing in their statements of policy. Next slide, please. So this is my final slide, and it's just a word about elected members. Um, we found that this has been really important because not only do we have cabinet and scrutiny and backbenchers on, but actually some of our mental health champions sit on key panels. So we've got them on the children's panel, the public health panel, the adult social care and the employment cabinet panels, where they can ask questions and be an advocate for mental health. And they've actually sponsored some deep dives. And for us, this is actually a way of doing sector led improvement. Now, later on this year, there will be a national sector led improvement exercise on suicide. Um, which will be done by ADPH with the Local Government Association and Public Health England. That will actually seek to look at every suicide prevention plan in the country and give some feedback region by region on what can be done. My ambition for next year is it'd be really nice to do a piece of sector led improvement nationally on the Prevention Concordat, um, but there is also some work that you can do regionally. The thing about sector-led improvement is it's public health taking control of its own improvement. So if region by region or area by area, um, you have improvement days or problem-solving days, that's a really good framework for getting people to look at their contribution. And my final comment would be about value. Um, the only reason for doing any work on this is if it adds value to people's lives. Uh, and if you pursue that, you'll probably end up with a framework and a plan that doesn't look like the nice ordered one you started with, but will probably have a lot more impact um, than the nice ordered one you thought you'd start with. Um, thank you. Jim, thank you very much indeed. Uh, a, a great one through um, of what you're doing in Hertfordshire. Um, I'm sure I won't be the only one sitting here going, right, well, um, when I leave London, I'm going to move to Hertfordshire or Somerset. It's very clear. Uh, some fantastic work. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Lily, I'll come to you for reflections in just one second, but Anna, once again, if people are wanting to join the discussion. Yep, so either post a question in the question box facility, um, email hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare or join us on Twitter using hashtag prevention. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and we'll come to questions in just sure. a second. Uh, but Lily, um, reflections on Christina and Jim's well, presentation. Well, first of all, just the richness, and but also as well, I think you know we've kind of got two of the most modest people in public health actually talking today, <laughs> because uh, again, it was every you, know, you see me writing um, at, at, at quite a lot about um, in terms of notes. I think um, what Jim didn't say that I do want to flag is that actually Hertfordshire is one of our first six areas to have signed up to the Venture Concordat, which is absolutely an amazing achievement, um, both personally uh, in terms of um, Jim's leadership and the way he's actually taken everything that's been talked about today in his presentation into real life, in that sort of changing how people think, bringing them together into a common goal, and also ultimately actually making a difference in people's lives. So again, I think you know it does demonstrate that. It, it can happen. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, this is our last of the, this sort of little run of webinars, so I think it's perfectly appropriate to hand out awards. So congratulations, yes. Christina and Jim, the inaugural winners of most modest people <laughs> to work in public health. Uh, and Jim, I like your smiley too. Very <laughs> impressive. Um, so I'm going to chuck it. I'm going to use Chair Frog and throw one uh, one question before we turn to the question coming through the text. That's okay. Um, uh, we'll start with uh, Jim, then go to Christina. Um, that both of you painted this sort of fantastic uh, picture of sort of the key to uh, success in public mental health being how you work with others. Um, Christina talking about pushing open doors. Uh, Jim, I loved what you said about. Uh, how you create a movement of actors. And um, to, to, to play devil's advocate, there are a lot of people who you'll be wanting to influence who have very long to-do lists uh, and will have other things on their on their minds other than how they can support public mental health. So I'd be really interested in in your take, Jim and Christina, on how you've how you've managed to win people round to this being a priority for them as well as just for you. Jim, do you want to start? Well, I, I guess the um, the first thing is to go in armed with where this could benefit them. And the beauty of Christina's presentation is she gives you almost a library of resources that you that you should use to learn about the topic you're going to talk about before you go in the door. The second thing is understand their challenges and pressures and get your head around where they are and find a way of articulating how this could at best benefit them or at least not add to the existing workload. So if you look at the Citizens Advice Bureau and Daniel who was one of our CAB chief execs who has gone to CAB National, he did masses of work to point out that mental health was actually one of the key issues behind most of people using Citizens Advice Bureau in our area. Uh, so together we actually did some training of all CABs in the county on how to signpost into prevention and mental health services. So I think it's it's understand their agenda and find hooks. Uh, otherwise, um, you'll be seen as well. And I have been, and I have approached this formally in the past. I've been seen as a burden. But there are some people who just will not want to work with you. And you just have to move on to somebody else and make them jealous. <laughs> Je jealousy, a key spur to improvement. Uh, Jim, thanks. Christina. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd echo everything um, Jim uh, said there. I think just to add, I, I think there's something about language here. Um, it certainly, uh, it, my experience is that um, most people either have some aspect of what they're doing that lends itself to this agenda, or actually there are they are advocates themselves and they're wondering why we're not going further and doing more. Um, so I think meeting people on their own ground, on their own terms, um, not getting too hung up about whether it's called mental health or mental health and well-being, as I said before, but understanding um, what the what the the bricks are that are going to take us to where where we where we get to. But I'd, I I would say, um, and and I think the way the the concordat's taken off, the way that the mental health champions have taken off, I think elected members across the country absolutely understand the mental health and well-being agenda because they see it in their surgeries day in day out. So our job is to help frame that, I think, um, and and to to think quite laterally. I I would encourage us um, uh, to do. 
So thank you. A uh, lovely point about language, um, and one Lily, which has come up across a whole range of events about how, when you have this need for cross sector approach, not going in and saying, "Well, we talk in my language or we, talk, we don't talk at all," yeah. uh, is all important. Yes, it's, uh, the thing about languages come up in two senses. One is it when you're working with big partners from different organisations and cultures, and also actually at an individual or community level. That you know, again, you know, some communities don't actually necessarily want to use the word mental health, not actually necessarily even because of stigma, but actually to have it articulated. It, what they are talking about is those issues, but actually they just feel much more comfortable using other language, or actually their objective is to get to a, a different point. Um, but again, that really works still for, for mental health and uh, positive mental health and well-being. So again, absolutely behind that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Anna? Yes, Questions. question time. Um, thank you to those who have um, submitted questions so far, and please do keep them coming. Um, we have a question from Anne-Marie, so thank you for this one. And I think linking to um, some of the great kind of resources that Christina um, mentioned in her presentation, um, Anne-Marie asks, how valuable or necessary is mental health first aid training for everyone? Workplaces, schools, um, the voluntary sector, it does so much in a comprehensive way. Um, lovely, thank you very much. We'll come to more in just a second. Uh, Christina, do you want to start on that? Importance of mental health first aid for anti neutral, somewhere in the middle? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, mental health first, tra uh, first aid training is a fantastic resource. It's a very well validated um, approach. Um, I think there are a number of, um, but we also have the ASSIST programme, which is the suicide prevention programme. I think what I've been keen to do for a while, and I, I can't, I don't know if they did it with men, uh, mental health first aid, is it, it's, it's a two day course to do it properly. But actually what we need also are some bite size um, products really, because not everybody can give the full two days. Um, there's the new Connect 5 programme, which Public Health England are pushing out. So I think we are building up a bank of really good resources and, and mental health first aid is absolutely up there, it's a terrific programme. Lovely, uh, and Jim, something you use in Hertfordshire? Uh, so we have uh, workplace champions and we haven't given them all the full two days, we give them a couple of hours. Uh, and um, we say, we basically cover you know, the fact that mental health is actually just like any other health issue and deal with stigma. Then we give some signposting issues. Our experience of mental health first aid training is it's most useful for people who might have issues um, themselves uh, for them to then help others. Um, we've also started a recovery college in Hertfordshire with the University and the Mental Health Trust, and that's been really helpful. So I agree with Christine with that we need smaller bite-sized chunk stuff. Um, and I think the key thing is training. Uh, and I'd also say for teachers, when we did the exam stress training, actually a lot of the stress training we were doing was aimed more at the teachers and the governors than the kids. Jim, thank you very much indeed. Anna, more questions? We do indeed. Um, thank you, Sam, for this question. So Sam asks, um, using a healthy public policy approach to consider mental health impacts in all public health decision making is a natural fit, but is there a way to make this more systematic? So are there any kind of um, further tools to uh, normalise this um, that you would advise? Uh, Sam, thanks very much. Uh, great question. Uh, and Jim, uh, how does that link, uh, point about how you sort of um, uh, normalise that, that approach and make it systematic, clearly linking to what you're saying about the need for need for a framework. You need to have an approach and to be how you're, see how you're comparing against them. Um, it's quite interesting because when we went for our health and our policies approach, the, the response of a lot of our members is we don't want to sheep dip the organisation and have yet another tick box exercise at the end because it is pointless, it's a waste of time. So we've called it mainstream health here because uh, we just like to be different and awkward. Uh, and um, we've got two strands to it. One is a workplace health strategy that's jointly owned by HR and public health. Um, and the second is a mainstreaming health so how can you consider the impact of all you do on health and how can you consider um, the impact of health on all you do and we're starting that slowly at the minute where it's worked well i think has been some of the money advice stuff and some of the cab stuff it's also worked very well i think in terms of um some of our uh beginning to handle workplace health so yeah, it, I think systematising it is good and it is an actual fit. Um, 
we've taken a very light touch approach to things like, you know, oh, you must do health assessments for this, that, and everything else. The thing I don't like about health and all policies is it just feels like a bit of a paper industry. Um, so we've gone with a, an impact uh, version rather than anything else. I don't know if that helps, and obviously we're happy to share whatever anyone wants from us. Um, Jim, I think that's that's great. I love Christina. I'll come to you on the, the same point in just a second. That, that again, very much echoing our discussion about language. And if people are going to see health mill policies as oh, great, okay, we'll just tick it and move on, then not not choosing to go down that that route. Uh, Christina, do you want to pick up this point about how you how you sought to make public mental health a sort of mainstream business in some sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think Jim's point's a good one. I mean, the, the challenge with with all of these things is you end up with a list and and uh, and it, and it, you get a, a tick box approach and it doesn't take you anywhere. Um, there are tools if people want to use them. There's there is health impact assessment methodology. Um, there is mental well-being impact assessment me methodology, but those to do those properly, they take time because what you're doing is a deep dive and triangulating all your intelligence with your partners. Um, so they are worth doing, but you can't do them all the time. You would have to you'd have to 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 choose your moment, as it were. I think when I think about uh, health in all policies, it's more a note to self actually rather than something that um, you would do, although I think Jim's described a very a very interesting way of, of approaching it in a, in a, in a more stru structured way. So the note to self is is more about uh, to remind ourselves that there are as many opportunities in engaging with um, the housing st the strategic housing agenda, um, the local, um, children's plan. Um, so it's about where we put ourselves and our energies and what languages, to go back to that, we learn to speak rather than uh, being a slightly more formal process, though I think both are probably valuable. Lovely. Christina, thank you. Uh, just a reminder, please do continue sending through questions. We've got about a quarter of an hour, quarter of an hour left. Maybe I'm going to pick up the conversation to on the same thing about mainstream business about uh, part of part of PhD's role, working with uh, sort of other government agencies and departments, but also other stakeholders. I imagine you end up having similar conversations to Christina and Jim about how this relates to others' work who might not have previously considered yeah. other mental health as their Yeah, so sometimes, and I think um, there was an earlier point about the um, you know, take, making ideas and making them happen. So, you know, with Public Health England, we've done a range of things from obviously developing things like the resources, but also working with colleagues in say, you know, sort of police, fire service, and looking at what they're already doing and actually how can we add some further, um, you know, some added, added twist to that. Again, you actually generally, usually using an example of something that's already happened. So for example, work that's already happening in Cleveland Police, let's also let's look at how we can work to make that sort of cascade elsewhere. Similarly, work that's been done with Network Rail, which so far has been very focused on um, suicide prevention rightly. Um, but also, again, when you look at it, you know, they're already doing work in the with their um, the staff of mental health and well-being, um, which is a key part of that suicide work. But actually, again, we can move that over into being more about positive mental health and, and you know, look at the preventative sides there as well. So, you can, so you know, it's upon that theme, you know, the same with you know, NHS England, with um, with other large organisations as well. And it's actually good, great to hear Jim giving the example of citizens' advice because they're actually they're one of the people we're talking to at the moment about actually how can they do something nationally. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, Anna, question? We do indeed. Um, thank you, Corinne, for this question. Um, so Corinne says, uh, notwithstanding all the fantastic discussion about this being about how to frame um, to suit local audiences, um, and working by open doors and not banging on closed ones, um, they still get questions from local stakeholders about the requirements from PHC to demonstrate how they are achieving compliance with the Prevention of Concord Act. So um, how do they kind of marry up that tension between um, uh, national requirements and perhaps local action? Lovely. Uh, Colin, thanks for joining. Uh, great question. And actually, we had a similar discussion early in, in Birmingham yesterday in terms of uh, uh, one area saying actually a bit of um, uh, sort of uh, top-down requirements um, can actually be quite constructive. Uh, Lily, we'll, we'll come to you in a second about sort of how um, boots on the ground, PHE are going to be here. 
Um, but Christina, what if we could start with you in terms of how do we get this balance right between local areas being firmly in the lead, but uh, sort of supported by by the national bodies um, in a sort of in 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 a, in a way which is going to be constructive rather than sort of domineering. Yeah, yeah. I think what is sometimes uncomfortable uh, about the ask when you get a national or, or need a regional ask um, around compliance or um, performance, that, that often that comes down to the people who really own who own the issue. <laughs> and actually, one of the one of the ways to think about it is it's that ask is to the organisation. So if I'm in a local authority, it's my local authority who is being asked how are you uh, responding to the Prevention Concordat for Better Mental Health local authority? And that may feel a bit uncomfortable, but uncomfortable, but actually it's a very useful lever. And the truth is, if you're not feeling a bit of discomfort, probably your issue isn't, isn't uh, visible. Once issues become visible, particularly in a democratic um, organization like a local authority, it will become a little bit uncomfortable because everybody will have a view. So that that's the first thing is 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 to to kind of to not to to welcome the question and to not feel defensive about it. The second thing, which is the boot on the other foot, is I will I would be quite robust. So in the local authority, you know how you are responding, you know how you are framing this, and you know um, how you want to talk about it and what language you are using. And it is absolutely up to local discretion how that message goes back to Public Health England. And I may have got this wrong, Lily, you can correct me, but my understanding of the Concordat is that it is framed to to poke us all to make sure, oh my goodness, sorry, I've got a phone. <laughs> did you all hear that? Um, did you hear my phone going off there? Sorry about that. It, it was a Skype phone, so it, it shot across my ski, uh, screen. Um, so I think the Concordat is, first of all, designed to poke us all a bit to sort of to get us thinking about this, and this, that's a good thing. But it's also been designed in such a way that it should be down to local um, discretion in terms of how we design it and account for ourselves. And I would be quite robust about that. Christina, thank you. Jim? Um, I'll be honest with you, the, the performance management of this by anybody had never crossed my mind um, because I don't see the Concordat as being about performance management. Um, and I don't think that's actually helps because performance management from national just we end up chucking data up rather than achieving outcomes. Um, whereas all the evidence on the kind of organisational change that, that the Concordat is trying to achieve is that we create learning, we create adaptability, we get um, organisations owning and acting on it. So um, I, I absolutely welcome the request from PHE to be transparent about what we do. And I think that runs not just in the direction of PHE and other national bodies, but it actually runs in the direction of um, elected members as well. So I think PHE's approach to this is helpful. Um, if it suddenly turned into perhaps, shall we say, another national body's rather kind of top down, thou shalt, um, then uh, I, my response would be go away um, to the other national body. Um, because actually, that's not what this Concordat is about. This, this Concordat is a test of my leadership in whether I can deliver any of this. And it's a test of, and the role of PHE is there to support and challenge and hold me. To account and also to support me with resources like my members. So I just see PHE as another in the coalition of allies helping me check if I've done it. Jim, thank you. Lily? Yes, I mean, again, reinforcing what's already been said is that, you know, with the Concordat, what we really want to secure 
is you know we deliberately chose the, the the term prevention planning arrangements which is about making sure that we've changed the direction of leadership so it's much more prevention focused so that the action that's happening whether it's in a service or it's in a community through communities with faith groups you know whatever is again more prevention focused a prevention focus on the area of mental health which also has a knock on to wider issues whether it's community safety or or other things like that so again that's kind of the first thing and then again, actually, also reinforcing that thing is that you know um, it's it actually I'm, we will be taking up the the sort of the the open door in a sense that of potentially having the sort of sector led leadership in the next you know in sort of 90, in nineteen twenty, but um, in the meantime, actually, you know, I, I think our public health England's job is all, is actually less about actually holding local areas to account, but it is about growing, encouraging helping areas that you know so everyone could be the best that they can be but again but at the same time you know again sort of using that continuing the little poker elements bit is that actually we might choose where we can to use you know work with organizations such as Ofsted for example you know can they weave some questions into their work that again is routine it's already happening about prevention same with CQC other things again are part of the system so we just really nip this in so it isn't and so in five years time we still see you know very clear evidence that the prevention concordat has changed things Lily, thank you very much indeed. Um, we've got about six or seven minutes left. Actually, uh, so if you've got any uh, burning questions you're yet to ask, now is the night time to, to throw it in. Um, so we've got a little bit more time for questions and then we'll do some key reflections. Uh, can, I, can I throw a question in my life? Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, Christina, Jim, um, obviously a lot, of, a lot of fantastic work going on in your areas um, and work which must have built up over over several years. Um, I'd be really interested in your advice to, to areas which might be at an earlier stage of their development, where they've got less of a uh, sort of illustrious track record of having of having really firm arrangements in place. I, I think Jim, you alluded to it earlier, that sort of the whole topic is so broad, it can seem quite difficult to know where to start. Um, what, what one piece of advice would you give to uh, a fellow local area which is just starting out on their public mental health journey, but wanting to make some some progress. Um, Jim, should we start and then go to Christina? Uh, for me, I think it's about pace. Um, this is a marathon, not a sprint. I know I keep saying that, but it's true. Um, so pace yourself and find some friends and find some, uh, some early areas where you can make some wins and take your time and copy shamelessly from other people. Jim, thank you very much indeed. And um, uh, Christina. Yes, I'd, I'd echo uh, what Jim said there. I think um, I would be surprised if there are any areas in the country which have no legacy of this work because we had the um, National Standard for Mental Health within which there, were, there was the um, mental health promotion and suicide prevention streams of work, both of which sat with public health. Um, every area had a mental health um, um, lit at, at, at some point. Now, I know there has been a lot of change, but I would be surprised if there's any area where there's nothing happening. So, um, it might be about reconnecting with some of that. Um, it's certainly about just starting. As we have been discussing, the agenda is huge. The opportunities are everywhere. And it, it really doesn't matter where you start. What's important is you start in a place which is comfortable for you, that is going to move forward. And I wouldn't, you know, I think going back to the, the previous discussion about are we going to have you know sector-led improvement or you know um is public health england going to hold us to account I, although it's helpful it's helpful to learn from each other i don't think it's helpful to sort of look next door and go oh my goodness they're doing you know and i'm not actually celebrate where you are accept where you are um and just start and and you know um, own own your own story. Um, don't try and emulate somebody else's. Christina, 
Christina, Jim, thank you very much. Really, uh, 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 to the point, Adam, valuable advice. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so we've just got a couple of moments left. Uh, so we're just going to do uh, a quick round round on key reflections. Uh, so we'll, we'll start here and then go to Jim and Christina. So uh, fellow panelists, what I'm after is just one key reflection from today's discussion and a, a fantastic discussion. Thanks so much, Christina, Jim, for joining, but also everyone who's joined and through questions. Uh, so I will start just to buy it everyone time. So I'll go then Anna, then Lily, then Jim, and then Christina. Christina will get the last last word. Um, so a key reflection for me is, um, Jim, I, I just loved your point about a movement of actors is as important about a, as important as a roadmap. And when we're talking about delivery, often the mental image we have is some plan with milestones on it. But that social capital, how you find friends, as you put it, Jim, I thought I really well put. Anna. Thank you. Um, yeah, Christine and Jim, I really liked your point um, around the importance of pushing out open doors rather than hammering on closed ones, um, and that you have to be opportunistic in your approach to um, work on mental health. Lovely. Yeah, for me, I really liked the idea of, you know, this really is about prevention focused ideas that happen locally. So, you know, again, when, and the themes of, you know, increasing protective factors, reducing exposure to risk and, and addressing harms that already happened. Thank you. Jim, any reflection? Um, I think it's, well, I often have a tendency of seeing things that haven't been done uh, because I like delivery and I like systems. Actually, um, we need to celebrate what has been done and recognise that work is happening and keep going and learn as we do that and make it adaptive. And I think I take that from Christine's um, presentations. Jim, lovely. Thank you very much. Christina. Yeah, I just like to say it's been really great being taking part in this conversation, both at the face to face events and in this webinar. And and that's the conversations that have taken place outside. You know, Jim and I had to have a conversation in terms of preparing this, um, listening, listening and looking back through the other webinars. Um, it, it just has been enormously valuable and um, it does feel like we are all, uh, you know, building a movement, which is which is great. Christina, what a joyous uh, ending for this uh, little one of webinars. Um, uh, we will need to send you an even bigger check. Oh, and Jim, we get a smiley as well. This is this is happiness all round. Uh, Christina, Jim, thank you so much for joining. Just as one reminder uh, of what's coming up. Uh, so we're in London on Tuesday, Liverpool on Wednesday. Uh, final event in Cambridge in April uh, and then we do hope you'll be back with us at the beginning of June we'll confirm that date shortly uh, just to have a reflection on the whole series yeah. series of events um, uh, so again all the details for that will be on the preventionconcordat.com website uh, it's about further ado we'd like to say uh, have a great weekend everyone thanks very much for joining and we hope to see you again thanks all goodbye bye bye